You may have recently heard about Russia's alleged bounty program in Afghanistan. This is a reported scheme where Russia would pay large sums of money to the Taliban and other militant groups for each Western soldier killed within the country from 2016 to 2019. Now, the initial leaks occurred back during the Trump administration, but there was not much of a follow-up, and so the whole thing sort of faded away. However, an update from a German investigation this week revealed that each kill was worth $200,000, and that Russia paid out at least $30 million overall. Do the math, and you get a minimum of 150 bounties collected. Now, none of this is confirmed, but there are similar allegations at lower financial levels involving Iran and China. As such, I think it is worth spending a moment to explain why these bounty programs are not as effective as they might seem on the surface. And the lesson is generalizable across many other strategic problems. In turn, it makes sense to spend a moment in the classroom to learn about it. In fact, I usually teach the subject as it relates to the protection of United Nations aid convoys, a happier if less relevant topic. Anyway, the central problem is something known as moral hazard. It is the idea that you can only write contracts around what is observable, not necessarily the actions that someone takes. This is best known within the realm of insurance. For example, imagine I left for work and realized halfway through my commute that I left my coffee machine on. Forget about moral hazard. That is a fire hazard. If I do not have insurance, I might want to rush home to turn the thing off. But if I do have insurance, then it is not as big of a deal if the whole thing burns down. Even though I was being reckless, I will still get paid out. Uh, hopefully in dollars and not rubles. That is because, regardless of the currency, the insurance company has a hard time making selective payments based on whether I was just being forgetful, or if I was deliberately altering my behavior as a consequence of having the insurance policy. A similar problem arises with bounty programs. Let's suppose for a moment that the allegations are true. Just how much did Russia benefit from the scheme? Well, you might say that it is the value that Russia places on 150 coalition deaths, minus the $30 million in costs. But not so fast. You see, the Taliban was in the business of killing coalition troops already. Even in the absence of bounty payments, many of those attacks were going to occur anyway. This would not be a problem for the scheme by itself, Except it is very difficult for someone in Moscow to differentiate whether an attack would have occurred naturally, or only happened because of the offered payout. You see, the Kremlin allegedly paid bounties based on each kill, and thus Russia was paying for many of those coalition losses that were going to happen regardless of the program. And the more inclined that the Taliban was to take action on its own, the more money that Russia wasted in the process. Now, I do not know exactly how many of those 150 coalition deaths are attributable to the bounty program, but it is definitely not 150, and the $30 million is locked in as a cost, no matter what the actual number was. To be clear, if Russia did in fact run the bounty program, it is best to default to the belief that those responsible still believe that the whole thing was profitable. It is just not nearly as good as it seems on the surface. And if you have stuck around this long, then you may be interested in seeing a simple algebraic illustration that illuminates the problem at hand. Imagine that the Taliban can either wait for an opportunity for an attack to arise, or it could actively seek one out. Let the value of a successful attack be V, and the probability that an opportunity will naturally arise is P. Meanwhile, if the Taliban seeks out the opportunity, success is guaranteed. Thus, the expected value of waiting is P times V, while the expected value of seeking it out is just V. Effort is costly though, so we also need to deduct C in costs. Compare the two, and clearly the Taliban ought to exert effort if C is less than 1 minus P times V. 
A naive look at the situation would indicate that Russia needs to provide a bounty payment B, large enough to make exerting effort better than nothing, which means setting the bounty B at least as large as C minus V. But not so fast. Remember, Russia cannot differentiate between a kill made with effort or just via a lucky opportunity. Bounties are paid for any kill, no matter the process. Thus, the payout to the Taliban for waiting for the opportunity to arise naturally increases to P times V plus B. Thus, the calculation to elicit active effort from the Taliban is to compare those two quantities. That works out to a bounty payment of at least C divided by 1 minus P minus V. And if you compare that to the naive world where moral hazard is not a concern, Russia has to overpay by a factor of C divided by 1 minus P minus C. Moreover, the naive benefit of the bounty program to Russia for each kill would seem to be V minus B, the value of a coalition loss minus the bounty price. But the real benefit is actually the marginal gain, which is V minus B for what actually happens, minus P times V, what Russia would have naturally obtained without a bounty program put into place. That works out to V times 1 minus P minus B. As such, the 1 minus P drags down the value of the bounty program. Moral of the story, bounty programs are an inefficient method to induce the behavior that you might want. Meanwhile, an efficient way to learn basic game theory strategy like this is to check out this best-selling introductory textbook. Bet you long-time viewers didn't see that one coming. But yeah, I had a normal career before the invasion. Anyway, check the video description for more information about it. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.